It's January, 1882, in Cleveland, Ohio. Inside the offices of Standard Oil, a shaft of morning light pours in through the windows. It lights up a row of men who sit hunched over their desks. The room is quiet and still. But the silence is broken by the sound of heavy footsteps as John D. Rockefeller enters the room. He wears a silk top hat and carries a long black umbrella. His expression is grim. Rockefeller walks past the row of men, his bookkeepers. One man looks up from his ledger and smiles, but Rockefeller strides right past him. Rockefeller then enters his private office and slams the door. In the office, he takes a seat and opens a book of accounts. He shakes his head in disgust. Usually, a good night of sleep helps him figure out the answers to all his worries, but not this time. He's finally run up against a problem that even he can't solve. Uh, come in, come in. The man in a gray wool suit enters. His name is Samuel Dodd, and he's Rockefeller's lawyer. Rockefeller sighs in relief. Dodd has a brilliant legal mind, and he's just the man that Rockefeller needs right now. Sam, uh, please take a seat. Dodd settles into a large chair, and Rockefeller continues. I've created a monster. I own 90% of the oil refineries in the entire United States, and you know what? I can't control a single one. What do you mean? You own the refineries, lock, stock, and barrel. You can do whatever you want with them. In theory, of course, I can. It's a sprawling empire. Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland. I have refineries all across the country. But how am I supposed to manage so many individual companies? It's spiraling out of my control. Well, you could stop acquiring new refineries or even sell some. Sell? No, you have to be joking. We've knocked down every competitor. We can't let up. We can't let them come roaring back. Not after everything I've accomplished. Rockefeller rises and begins pacing the room. We have to keep growing. The question is, how do you control all of these individual refineries but keep them under a single business? Dodd sits back in his chair, thinking, John, it's difficult. The government has laws on the books. They don't want a single company to be so big and so strong, strong enough to own businesses in every state. Yeah, so what do we do? Rockefeller watches as a wicked smile stretches across Dodd's face. Well, you know, I, I think I've got something. So we don't create a single central company that you use to control your empire, no. We create something else. A trust. Here, let me show you. Dodd quickly reaches into his bag and takes out a notebook. He grabs a pen from the desk and begins to draw a diagram. Here at the bottom, you have Standard of Ohio. An individual business. One of your many refineries. And also here at the bottom, Standard of New York. And on and on and on. It's your whole empire. But right now, they're split apart in pieces. As you said, all separate companies. Yes, this is the problem. Yeah, of course, but what if Dodd takes his pen and sets it on the words Standard of Ohio, then draws a line going up like a string on a puppet? He draws the same line coming up from the words Standard of New York, and he traces those lines up to the top of the page where he writes three more words, Standard Oil Trust. So here, we're not going to create a single company. That's not allowed. Instead, we'll create a trust. All your individual companies will make a legal pledge. It's like when you give someone power to be a guardian over a child. Your companies will entrust you with that power. You'll be the guardian, pulling these strings. Rockefeller squints, staring at Dot. That sounds illegal. Could you really conceal these operations? We pay off enough politicians as it is. I swear to you, John, no state will be able to track it. No one has seen anything like this before. As far as they know, Standard of Ohio is still distinct from Standard of New York. But you and your executive committee will have all the power. Finally, it'll operate like a single central company. Rockefeller gazes into the distance, considering the proposal. Then he walks over to Dodd and reaches out for a handshake. Sam, I like it. But please, hurry. I need this trust formed as quickly as possible. This disorder is driving me mad. The two men grin and shake hands, and a moment later, Dodd leaves the room. Rockefeller settles back into his chair. He finally feels like himself again. He considers this bold new scheme and slowly brushes his thumb over his cufflink. It's made of a black gem, and like a royal seal, it's emblazoned with the letter R for Rockefeller. Rockefeller feels strong and untouchable. He's sure of it. If this plan succeeds, it will give him more power than he could ever imagine. It could also make him the richest man in the country, Maybe even the richest in the world.
from Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. The Standard Oil Trust was something the world had never seen before. It gave John D. Rockefeller an unparalleled amount of power. With the trust, Rockefeller was able to control a wide variety of businesses, from oil refineries to pipelines to railroad cars. He also controlled Standard's aggressive marketing divisions, which fought to ensure that every household in America burned Standard kerosene and heating oil. In effect, Rockefeller invented the modern holding company and laid the groundwork for the vast multinational companies that are common today. But the practice was new in the late 1800s, and so Rockefeller and Standard Oil avoided widespread public scrutiny. But as the years unfolded, the company grew reckless and vulnerable to attack. Soon, a determined journalist decided to strike. Her name was Ida Torbel, and she began to hold Rockefeller accountable for his wrongdoings. This is Episode 3, The Flood. It's the summer of 1881 in Columbus, Mississippi. A pair of horses turn a corner and trot along the main street of this southern town. The horses' hooves stomp on the dirt road and kick up dust. A shopkeeper looks over at the horses and notices that the animals are pulling a wide cart loaded with barrels painted blue which bounce with each rut in the road. Yet the shopkeeper has no trouble reading the words on the barrels. They say Standard Oil Company. The horses pass by the shopkeeper's small grocery and he quickly grows suspicious. He grabs his bowler hat and begins following the cart. He has a bad feeling about this and he can't let it go, not after what happened a month ago. It was then that the shopkeeper first saw those blue barrels, printed with the words Standard Oil. That day, a similar cart stopped in front of the shopkeeper's store. A salesman with a long, bushy mustache stepped down from the cart and entered the store. The man said he was selling Standard Kerosene. He claimed it was the best kerosene around, that Americans all across the nation use it to light their lamps. The salesman seemed friendly at first. But that changed when the shopkeeper said he already had a kerosene supplier and that he wasn't interested. The salesman insisted that the shopkeeper purchase standard oil kerosene. He wouldn't relent, and so finally the shopkeeper had to ask him to leave. That's when the salesman lowered his voice and stepped close to the shopkeeper. He said that if the shopkeeper didn't buy standard kerosene, he could expect trouble. The salesman then said he would open a competing grocery store down the street. He'd sell everything from flour to potatoes, and he'd keep his prices low, so low, in fact, that he'd run the shopkeeper out of business. The shopkeeper laughed at this absurd threat, and he didn't think any more of it. But now he feels weighed down with dread, because here are those blue barrels once again moving down the street. The shopkeeper picks up his pace and keeps following the cart. He's sweating and choking on the dust the horses are kicking up. Then the cart stops in front of an empty storefront, only blocks away from his own store. Workers begin unloading the barrels and bringing them inside. The shopkeeper gets closer and notices that another cart is being unloaded. This one doesn't have barrels of kerosene. Instead, it has heaters, lamps, and stoves, everything needed to burn kerosene in a home. And each product bears the same name, Standard Oil. The shopkeeper begins to shake. And then he grows hot with rage when he sees a sign in front of the store. It lists a wide number of products for sale. Meat, sugar, coffee, flour, potatoes and they're all selling at absurdly cheap prices. The shopkeeper is stunned. He knows he can't match them. People are going to flock to this new store, and he'll be ruined. The shopkeeper stands, staring at this new competitor, and that's when he sees the man with the bushy mustache step out from the store. The shopkeeper rushes over and demands to know why the salesman would do this. Why go through all this trouble just to ruin another man's life? The salesman smirks, looks him dead in the eye. Then he says the shopkeeper was given a choice. He could buy standard oil kerosene, or he could stay with a competitor and face the consequences. The shopkeeper's mouth falls open. He stutters, trying to find the right words. But before he can, the salesman smiles and turns away. Then he enters the new grocery store and begins nailing a sign to the wall. When he finishes, he looks at the shopkeeper and smiles. The sign reads, Now open. It's five years later in New York City. John D. Rockefeller stares out the window of his penthouse office. Off in the distance, he can see ships docked in New York's harbor. Right now, men are loading blue barrels of kerosene into those ships. Standard Oil refined that kerosene and continues to rake in huge profits. 
enough to build this nine-story building overlooking the southern tip of Manhattan. Rockefeller leaves the window. He feels a wave of pride as he returns to a large mahogany desk. In what feels like the blink of an eye, Rockefeller has made a fortune. He used to be a poor boy with no money to his name. Now he's the most powerful oilman in the entire country, and possibly the entire world. So it's fitting that Standard Oil moved its headquarters to New York City. This sprawling metropolis is the epicenter of American capitalism and a proper home to an enterprise like Standard Oil. For Rockefeller, the move from Cleveland felt like proof that Standard Oil had finally arrived on the world stage, and it was proof that the company was all-powerful and unstoppable. At his desk, Rockefeller picks up a report and begins reading it. The report is from a man who works for the railroads. He and Rockefeller have a mutually beneficial agreement. Rockefeller bribes him, and in return, the man supplies Rockefeller with information about Standard Oil's competitors. The reports have been enormously helpful and allowed Standard to maintain its advantage over the market. Normally, Rockefeller is pleased to read these letters. But as he reads today's report, Rockefeller's mood quickly grows dark. The railroad agent says there's troubling news out of St. Louis. One of Standard Oil's competitors has just flooded the city with a large shipment of kerosene, Standard Oil is getting beaten in this lucrative market. Rockefeller finishes reading the report, then pounds his desk in frustration. He doesn't understand how this could have happened. Standard is the most powerful refiner in the country. It holds an iron grip over America's cities. So why is it suddenly getting beaten by a competitor in St. Louis? Rockefeller begins flipping through his catalog of reports from his intelligence network, searching for an answer. That's when he hears a knock on the door. His secretary peeks into the room and tells Rockefeller it's nearly noon, time for his daily lunch meeting with the Standard Oil directors. Rockefeller stands and takes a deep breath. Soon he'll meet with the men who help him run Standard Oil. He'll demand answers about this new report from St. Louis, and if he's not satisfied with their responses, Rockefeller won't hesitate to make big changes fast. Minutes later, Rockefeller leaves his office and heads down a long, carpeted hallway. He passes through a series of doors, each equipped with special devices. The doors can only be opened by those who know how to correctly turn the knobs. This adds extra security to the building, and Rockefeller grins as he imagines a snooping journalist getting trapped between the doors. Rockefeller opens the final door and passes into a room decorated with hunting trophies. The heads of elk, boar, and other animals line the wall. At the long table are Standard Oil's directors. Most of them used to be rivals from refineries in Titusville, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and New York. But one by one, each of the men realized they'd been beaten. And soon they joined Standard Oil and began fighting for the company with a nearly religious enthusiasm. Rockefeller takes his usual seat next to John Archbald, who is now his most trusted deputy. And with his eyes narrowed, Rockefeller addresses the room. Gentlemen, I've just received troubling words from our intelligence network. Shameful news, which should make all of you worried. The directors exchange nervous glances. Rockefeller continues, I've learned that one of our competitors is shipping large quantities of kerosene to St. Louis. They're beating us and stealing our customers. We're losing one of the most important metropolitan markets in the country. John Archbald turns to face Rockefeller. Well, this is outrageous. Our marketers in St. Louis must answer for this. They must and they will. But they're not the only ones to blame. Look around this room. Look at the men entrusted to run this company. We hold the power, and that means we hold the responsibility. But we've done everything in our power. Not everything. Rockefeller gazes across the table. The director's faces look solemn and downcast. Yes, we've been successful, but we've grown lazy. We've failed to change tactics now that we control the market. It's time to adapt. But John, you, you said it. We control the market. What else would you have us do? Stop expanding. Stop growing. For now. At this point, we must defend our territory. We have to retake St. Louis and prevent any similar competition in the future. Archibald considers this and leans forward. Well, we can, we can give away lamps and stoves, drive up consumer demand for kerosene. Our competitors might drop their prices, but then we'll drop our prices even more, even if that means we'll take a short-term loss. But we have the power to do this. We can push back the competition. Rockefeller nods. He's proud to see Archibald proposing such a bold initiative. Hmm. Good. These are exactly the right ideas. And there's one more. We must also split up the country into separate territories. We'll divide and conquer each, stomping out the competition one by one, until no one can compete with Standard Oil ever again. 
The directors cheer this proposal, and Rockefeller looks across the room, smiling. He knows that every problem has a solution, and every hiccup, however minor, must be dealt with. Standard Oil is the most powerful refiner in the country, and John D. Rockefeller isn't going to let that title slip away. It's a warm and sunny day in June 1892. Today, a group of children have gathered on the lawn of the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris, France. They're spread out in the grass and giggling while watching a puppet show. Ida Tarbell stands to the side in the shade of a large chestnut tree. Tarbell is now 34 years old. She has her dark hair pinned up in a bun and wears a long sleeve floral dress. She fans herself with her hand and continues to watch as the children grasp and grab at each other. A marionette crashes into a wall and the children howl with laughter in their squeaky voices. Tarbell grins and turns from the stage. She continues strolling down a gravel path. Tarbell loves her life here in Paris. She arrived in France about a year ago after coming all the way from Pennsylvania. She had $150 in her pocket and a dream to live a new, exciting life. Tarbell had saved that money while working as a magazine editor. She took the job because she realized that as a woman, she could never be a scientist, not even with a college degree. She enjoyed editing, but she also missed the feeling of making new discoveries. She wanted to see the world up close, just like she used to with her microscope. But with that career path closed to her, she decided to become a writer. She wanted a fresh start, and one that was far from the oil fields of Pennsylvania. She figured it didn't get much farther than Paris. Tarbell feels free from her past, and already she's been wildly successful in her career. She's publishing articles in American magazines and newspapers, and even though she can't be a scientist, she gets to write about scientific topics. So for her, she figures life couldn't get much better. But today, something feels off. Tarbell has a vague notion that something has happened. She can't put her finger on it. So she exits the garden through a wrought iron gate, heads to a nearby kiosk where she buys a newspaper. Her life in France may feel perfect, but Tarbell can't deny she still gets homesick. She practically inhales the letters her mother sends, and now, with a newspaper in hand, Tarbo flips through the page with foreign news. She's hungry for an update from the United States, and she's eager to set aside this strange, ominous feeling she's had all day. But a headline midway down the page sends a shock through her spine. She can't believe the words. The newspaper says a dam has broken in Titusville, Pennsylvania. The town has been destroyed by flood and fire. Tarbo's mouth goes dry. She imagines a wall of water rushing down Main Street, destroying everything in its path, including her family's home. She quickly scans the rest of the article. It says most of Titusville is either burned or underwater. As many as 150 people are dead, the rest have fled to the hills. Tarwell doesn't hesitate. She picks up her long skirt and begins running down the street. She needs to get to her apartment. She prays her family has sent a telegram or, or something. She prays they're not dead. Tarbell turns a corner and suddenly runs into a man who's smoking a cigarette. He curses at her and waves his arms, but she doesn't stop. She keeps running past him. He doesn't matter right now, she thinks. Paris doesn't matter right now. Tarbell's thoughts begin to swirl as she runs down a cobblestone street. How could she abandon her family and move so far away? Her little sister has been recently ill. How selfish to abandon her, Tarbell thinks. And it's not just her sister. Her father's business is still sinking, and Standard Oil bullies the entire region. Tarbell is a block from her apartment and nearly out of breath. She clenches her fingers until her fists cramp. She could have done something. She could have helped her family instead of moving so far away, pursuing some childish dream. Now her home is gone. Her family might be gone, too. Tarbell reaches her building and throws open the front door. She races up the stairs. When she reaches the landing, her landlady is waiting at the apartment door. Without saying a word, the woman hands Tarbell a slip of white paper. It's a telegram from Tarbell's brother, William. Tarbell's hands shake as she unfolds the paper. On it is a single word. She reads, takes a deep breath, and closes her eyes. She feels like she's going to fall over. For a moment, she stops breathing. Then she forces her eyes open, takes a deep gulp of air, and reads the telegram once again, feeling dizzy with relief. The one word on the telegram is safe. Tarbell leans against the wall, breathing heavily. Her family is alive. They survived the accident. She'll be able to see them once again. Tarbell turns and looks out the hallway window. She gazes at the Paris skyline. In the short time she's been here, this city has felt like a magical escape. But now it's just another city. 
in a place far, far from home. It's autumn, 1893. The main street of Titusville, Pennsylvania is lined with burnt and scattered timber. Franklin Tarba looks out from his front porch, gazing at all the wreckage. He stares silently. His face is lined with worry and his beard is flecked with gray. It's been a year since the great flood and fire, but he'll never forget the day the dam broke. It all happened so fast. The floodwaters washed over the refineries. It then sent a wall of water, oil, and fire roaring through the town. That day, Franklin and his wife, Esther, stood on this very porch watching. They were ready to abandon their home if the water rose any higher, but somehow their house survived. But that didn't stop the bad news from coming. Recently, the oil market took a huge hit and prices dropped. Then, just days ago, Tarbell discovered that his business partner killed himself. It was a horrible shock and added to Tarbell's other misery. He learned that his company's finances are in terrible shape. Tarbell exhales raggedly like he's been holding his breath this whole time. Then he turns and walks inside. His wife, Esther, quickly stands up from the sofa as he enters. She searches his face with a look of concern. You heard back from the bank? Franklin nods, but he can't look at his wife directly in the eyes. Yeah, they want the debts paid now. They said it doesn't matter that my partner died. We're responsible for his half of the money. Franklin, what are we going to do? How can we get that sort of money? Tarbell gathers his courage. Then he looks up at Esther. There's only one way. We have to mortgage the house. No, it hasn't come to that. I'll go back to teaching. You haven't taught for 30 years. That doesn't matter. I can do it again. Well, even so, it won't be enough. I'm done. I'm done fighting. I can't win. Not if I'm up against giants like Standard. You made an honest living. That's more than John D. Rockefeller can say. Mm -hmm. Like that's consolation. Because while I was sticking to my principles, we lost our business. Now we're going to lose the roof over our heads. Franklin, the market will come back. It always does. Somehow we'll make the payments. We'll make this work. Franklin approaches his wife and embraces her. The two hold each other quietly until Franklin is hit with another worry. What do we tell Ida? She's doing so well in Paris. I don't want her thinking she should rush back here to help us out. She has a career there. There's nothing here for her in Titusville. I'll write to her and tell her exactly that. She should stay in Paris. We'll be fine. Franklin lays a kiss on his wife's forehead and steps back. Then he wipes a tear from his eye, steals a glance at the piano where Ida first learned to play music. He remembers how proud he felt to get her the piano and lessons, but now he feels the overwhelming heaviness of shame as another thought crosses his mind. He could make good money selling that piano. Tarville shakes his head. No, he can't do that. Not yet. Somehow they'll get through this. It's a year later in the fall of 1894. A wooden buggy bounces as it travels over a rough stretch of road. Ida Tarbell looks out from the front seat and gazes at the distant tree line of Titusville, Pennsylvania. She glances left at her brother William. He sits beside her holding the reins on a pair of horses. As she stares at these dusty roads, Ida feels a strange mixture of comfort and sadness. For three years, she was separated from her family by an ocean. It's good to be home, back in a place that feels so familiar, and even now it's still a relief that none of her family members died in the big accident when the dam broke and destroyed the town. So for Ida Tarbell, this should be a triumphant return. She's a successful writer, and she even has a promising new job, working full-time at an ambitious new magazine called McClure's. She'll have the chance to investigate important stories and explore them at length. She never could have imagined such a job would exist or that she, a woman, could get it. But even though she's happy to be home, and even though her family members all survived the flood, Ida can't help but feel some amount of bitterness. That feeling hits her the moment the buggy reaches the crest of the hill. William pulls back and stops the horses. He points at a high earthen wall, one that seems to rise toward the sky. William tells Ida that that's the dam that broke. It didn't just destroy the city. It destroyed her father. Ida winces. She imagines a flood of water rushing into town. It's true that her family members all survived, but her father's business did not. After the flood, his business and oil production finally collapsed. The local economy was devastated, and Ida's father simply couldn't compete with John D. Rockefeller, not with all the politicians in his pocket or his network of spies. And so while Franklin Tarbell survived the flood, he emerged a profoundly different man. Ida could sense it the second she saw him. Her father looked frail, hunched over. His voice was weaker, and he seemed defeated. Looking at the dam, Ida Tarbell sighs, shakes her head. 
She turns to her brother and explains that the flood was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Rockefeller was coming for their father and all the other men like him who tried to fight against Standard Oil. Eventually, surely, they would have lost. The flood only made that faster. Ida's brother, William, sneers. He reminds Ida that the government hasn't been any help. Sure, Congress made it illegal for Rockefeller to form his little pact with the railroads, and they passed a law to fight against monopolies. But both laws are toothless. Nothing's happened. It seems like no one can beat Standard. And Standard just keeps growing. Ida gazes at the sky, and she remarks on how impossible it all seems. An entire industry could end up in the hands of just one man? It goes against the spirit of fair play. Her brother, William, snickers and says it's not like Congress or the President or any of the states are going to do anything about it. This story is over. Ida straightens her skirt, looks back at her brother with an intense gaze. But what if the story isn't over, she says. William raises an eyebrow. Ida continues. This could all change, she says. But first, people need to know the truth about Rockefeller. Then, once his cruel tricks are known to the public, finally, people will do something. They'll stop buying standard kerosene they'll take action. Her brother nods, but looks unconvinced. How do you get common folk to understand what Rockefeller has done? But Ida smiles with a fiery look in her eyes. It's simple, she says. You start digging, you uncover the truth, and then when you find it, you write about it. You tell the world. William gets a conspiratorial look on his face and asks Ida whether this has something to do with her new job for that magazine. But Ida only blinks and points at the reins on the horses. Let's go home, she says. We've both got a lot of work to do. It's the spring of 1896 in New York City. From his ninth floor office, John D. Rockefeller stares out the window. Right now, he's lost in thought. Something that's been happening often. Finally, he understands why. Rockefeller built Standard Oil into an unrivaled empire. Standard owns the refineries, the pipelines, the tank cars. Now it owns a large share of the actual oil wells and even dominates the market for petroleum byproducts. The entire country depends on Standard Oil. If he chose to, Rockefeller could shut down the railroads simply by refusing to sell them grease for their engines. With so many accomplishments and so much power, Rockefeller realizes that he may have reached the top. There's nowhere else to go from here. In his office, Rockefeller paces, thinking about next steps. He'd like to focus on philanthropy, and he spent a considerable amount of time establishing the University of Chicago. But perhaps it's time to make a big decision, to change his role at Standard Oil. There's a knock at the door. Rockefeller's secretary enters, looking apologetic. He says he's sorry for the intrusion, but Rockefeller's brother, Frank, is in the building. He's demanding to be let in. Rockefeller sighs, and before he can answer, Frank barges in. Rockefeller can already sense that he'll have to defuse yet another problem with his troubled brother. Frank, what brings you to New York? Well, brother, I thought you knew everything that goes on around here. I don't know everything. I'm not God. Sure act like it. Rockefeller tenses up. He can already sense the lashing that's coming his way. So he waits patiently for Frank to continue. So why am I here? I'm a vice president of the company. My presence is required from time to time. Frank, you're a vice president of Standard of Ohio not the Standard Oil Trust. You know, I could be of use here in New York if you'd only let me. But every time I make a contribution, you just belittle me. What about Standard of Ohio's success? That success has nothing to do with you. I myself built Standard Oil. It practically prints money for its stockholders, including you. Frank begins to speak, but Rockefeller cuts him off. And on that note, I have something to share with you. I've decided that it's time for me to retire. I will retain my title of president and continue to be briefed on affairs, but I'll be stepping aside. Rockefeller sees Frank's surprise. Who will be taking your place? John Archibald will assume the helm. Archibald, the little man with a big mouth. What about family? What about me? Rockefeller sits back in his chair. He's allowed Frank to poke at him for an entire lifetime, and he's always suffered it with polite silence. He's tired of that. What about you? Well, you're a drunk and a gambler. You've never pulled your weight. You never gave me a chance to pull my weight. I see you don't deny the drunken gambler. Frank, I made you rich. You'd be nothing without me. Frank's face grows red, and as he speaks, his voice begins to crack, and droplets of spittle shoot from his mouth. You won't even forgive me my loans. I'm I'm the richest man in the world for a brother, and he's heartless. Heartless. You know what? This is the last time we'll speak, John. The last time. Well, that's just as well. 
I'm sure Archibald will be kind enough to keep you on the payroll once I'm gone. At that, Rockefeller calls for his secretary, who rushes Frank out of the room. Rockefeller feels tired and worn out, but he's confident that he's made the right move. Archibald is the man to succeed him. He might be cocky, but Archibald reminds Rockefeller of himself in one crucial way. They both want to win at all costs. Rockefeller shakes his head. He's nearly laughing. No, he wouldn't dream of letting someone like Frank drive his perfect company into the ground. A man like Archibald will keep fighting, making sure that Standard Oil stays on top of the world. It's long past midnight in November 1898. John Archibald sits at his desk, cast with the orange glow of a nearby lamp. His shadow flickers against the wall as he writes a letter. Archibald snuck into this room as quietly as possible. He didn't want to wake his wife. He'd rather she remain in the dark about his business affairs, especially affairs of this kind. Archibald forms precise letters on the paper with a nib of his fountain pen. He pauses, a satisfied smile spread across his face. This letter is going to get results and it will ensure that Archibald remains one of the most powerful men in the world of oil, or maybe just the world. A little over a year ago, Archibald took charge of Standard Oil. John D. Rockefeller went into retirement, but he's still far and away Standard's largest shareholder. That's why Archibald briefs him on the company every week. Still, Archibald knows that this is his moment to shine. He's already begun to put his own bold touch on Standard's day-to-day affairs, and this letter is a perfect example. Right now, Archibald is offering to bribe a senator from Ohio. He hovers his pen over the page and then writes that he approves of the senator's work. That's why he's giving the man a gift of $15,000. But he reminds the senator of a pressing issue. There's the pesky matter of some antitrust legislation that's floating around the Senate. Archibald writes that he's confident the senator will have no difficulty killing it. Just then, Archibald hears the floorboards creak in the hallway. He instinctively pulls the letter into his lap. The door opens, and Archibald finds his wife standing in the doorway, her eyes bleary. She asks what he's doing, says it's not healthy to be working at this hour. Archibald lays down his pen, looks at his wife intensely. He says there's nothing more important than work, nothing in the world. She begins to speak, but he stops her. She should go back to bed. So she shakes her head and relents, backing out of the doorway. Archibald takes the letter from his lap and lays it back on the desk. The paper is a little crumpled, but he decides not to start over. He knows that a few wrinkles won't matter, as long as the money is good. Throughout the country, Americans are increasingly turning hostile to business monopolies. But Archibald knows that if he keeps the right politicians on the payroll, Standard will come out without a scratch. Finally, with the letter complete, Archibald makes out a certificate of deposit for $15,000. He writes the numbers with a dramatic flourish. Unlike Rockefeller, who treated bribes as an unpleasant necessity, Archibald believes all bribery should be done with relish. He then seals up the letter and certificate and gazes out the window at the moonless night. He's determined to be more than just a caretaker of the Standard Oil Trust. He will expand on Rockefeller's legacy. And with enough bold moves and late nights, he will forge a legacy of his own. It's late 1899. Ida Tarbell enters the offices of McClure's Magazine in Manhattan. She surveys the office, where several writers and editors are bent over their desks in deep concentration. She walks past them, and several colleagues look up and nod. Tarbell smiles and tips her hat. Tarbell has been writing for McClure's ever since she returned from Paris, but she still can't believe her good fortune. Each month, her articles appear alongside fiction from Mark Twain, Willa Cather, and Robert Louis Stevenson. But McClure's is getting the most attention for its nonfiction the magazine has been producing a new, aggressive form of public journalism. The articles have exposed corruption and advocate for reform. For Ida Tarbell, this is the highest calling and the most important writing in America. Tarbell moves through the magazine's headquarters and enters the office of S.S. McClure, the magazine's founder. McClure is leaning back in his chair, rubbing his fingers through his sandy blonde mustache. When he notices Tarbell, he jumps to his feet and greets her. His face is beaming with excitement. Tarbell knows that he has a childlike curiosity about the world and a desire to explore new ideas. Still, she's never seen him look this enthusiastic. A moment later, he explains why he's in such a good mood. He tells Tarbell that he's made a decision. He wants her to be the magazine's managing editor. She's created a number of hits, including her biographies of President Lincoln and Napoleon. She has a vision, McClure says, and he wants Tarbell to guide the magazine. Of course, he adds, she'll still get to write. Tarbell is stunned. This is an opportunity beyond anything she could have imagined when she moved to Paris to become a writer. 
She begins to thank McClure, and he reaches out to shake her hand. He says he'll make this official as soon as he can, but in the meantime, she shouldn't let it distract her from her next story. Tarbell feels like she's floating. She begins to walk out the office, then stops. She turns around, and with a radiant smile, she thanks Mr. McClure. Tarbell then returns to her desk, her head spinning with ideas. This promotion makes it clear. She's free to take on any subject she pleases, no matter how ambitious. She has a vote of confidence from McClure himself. Tarbell picks up a pen and turns it over in her hand. Then, like a jolt of electricity, the idea comes. She's going to investigate the rise of large companies in America. For Tarbell, their massive power threatens the very idea of democracy. She can think of no better subject than the largest business of them all. The company that loomed over her childhood and that haunts her family in her hometown to this day. Ida Tarbell is going to investigate Standard Oil. From Wondery, this is Episode 3 of The Breakup of Big Oil from American Scandal. In our next episode, Ida Tarbell launches a searing investigation of Standard Oil and receives unlikely support from John D. Rockefeller's inner circle. If you'd like to learn more about The Breakup of Big Oil, we recommend the books Titan, The Life of John D. Rockefeller by Ron Chernow, All in a Day's Work by Ida Tarbell, and Taking on the Trust by Steve Weinberg. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Barons. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Michael Canyon Meyer. Edited by Christina Malsberger. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marshall Louie for Wondering.